questions you had from reading the book. And I just want to say before we get started, I'm, I'm so thankful for everyone who, who participated in the book read. Um, to be able to get to learn a little bit about our keynote before he got here. Um, I've talked with lots of classes and lots of students about this book, and the, the message I've heard back is pretty resounding that this was a, a powerful read. And for many of you, uh, you've even personally expressed to me that you took a lot away from this reading. And so uh, that was always the goal, right? This wasn't meant to be a textbook that you'd be a, take an exam on at the end. I hope your uh, faculty didn't give you an exam on the book. The idea of this entire project was to get you to reflect on some of the incredible thoughts that Johan brings uh, centered around uh, depression and some of its causes. So with that, are you ready, Johan, to come on up? Yeah, come on up. Let's give him another round of applause. Yes. Hello. Uh, so as I mentioned, this will be pretty. Can I ask, is there any way you got, I, I don't know where the technical people are. Is there any way you can turn down the light a little bit? If you can't, it's not a big deal. If you I just over, over. Yeah, yeah, you oh, can. Yeah, yeah, I'm not in you the see, light. See, that's the so. kind of logical solution that would never. <laughs> you, you just got to get close. the apocalypse and we will die. So, yeah. It's back up. Okay. Yep, it went down for a second. Uh, but the YouTube faculty are getting emails from students. The YouTube stream went down for a, mo a moment, but uh, I just talked with Robert. He put it back up. So um, if you get those messages, please just uh, let them know that we're up and rolling again on that same link. All right. Is, is that light better? I slightly feel like it's well, burning. Why don't we do this? We'll just switch spots. There's oh. no light there. Perfect. Are you sure that's OK? I feel like yeah. I inflicted it on you now. But the... All right, perfect. All right. You can both move over a little more, and then yeah. Yeah, you don't have to be in the, in the spotlight. Actually, look at this. Perfect, yeah. Great. Ah, I feel much better. Okay. Well, at first, I want to thank you. You've come a long ways to be with us. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I was just sharing with the students um, my appreciation for them reading your book and the, the conversations that I've had with lots of classes about the book and what they're taking away. I can tell that uh, these students were able to apply a lot of what, what you were uh, talking about. So as I mentioned, the, the process for this is really informal and just an opportunity to chat with the author. I, I, I mean, when I was an undergrad, I never once had an opportunity to meet the authors of the books that I was required to read in class. And so uh, what a really cool gift uh, to, to be able to do that this afternoon. So I have to start with maybe the most important question and before we kind of turn it over to you. Are you okay with that, Johan? I started I, the first let's one. Let's do it. I mean, I've been thinking about this all night, how I wanted to phrase this and, and really kind of what to expect from the answer, but I really have to know, is London anything like it's represented in Ted Lasso? <laughs> so I'm the only British person who knows literally nothing about soccer, so <laughs> it like completely puzzles me. I quite like looking at men in shorts, but that's the limit of my interest. Um, so uh, I don't know if, I guess, um, yeah, I think... I love comedies about Americans and British people interacting because uh, obviously I live half the year here and half the year there. And um, I think what, what Ted Lasso gets at really well is, you know, there's a question that Americans ask each other all the time that I have never heard a British person ask, which is Americans say to each other, it's totally lovely, say, what's your story? Right? It's a very American question. The only context I can imagine a British person saying that would be in a police interrogation. Be like, be very. What's your story? It would, the only way a British person would ask that would be like a hostile. Like Americans have an amazing capacity. Doesn't matter if you're like a, you know, a young black kid in West Baltimore or a super conservative person coming out of Mar-a-Lago. All Americans have an answer to that question. What's your story? Uh, and it's totally lovely. And you really get that sense in like Ted Lasso that like the kind of British reserve and like, like I, like I mentioned about Oprah before, like I remember when Oprah was first broadcast in Britain and people were like, oh my God, how do they, how can they go on television and talk about their feelings in this way? People were like horrified and disgusted, but it's slightly better now. But, uh, but yeah, so Ted Lasso is actually quite... Uh, yeah. Well, great. I, I've been I've been hemming and hawing about that question uh, for quite a while. So I, I when I open up, I know I'd mentioned a few students I'd asked who had questions, and I know you did. And so if you have questions, you can make your way over to the the table with uh, Dean Rutherford to use the microphone. But as we're queuing up, 
Ah, queuing. Ah, we're ah, good. See, see. Uh, as we're queuing up for those questions, I, I kind of wanted to start with one that I had. Um, you know, you wrote Lost Connections a few years before COVID, right? I mean, this this thing, your ideas and your hypotheses about the connections and how meaningful and important they are um, was something way before we've been as isolated as we has been the, these past two years. And so I'm just kind of curious, what has changed or reinforced your hypotheses in Lost Connections since COVID-19? So someone wrote to me at the height of lockdown and said, it's like we're doing an experiment to see if you're right. <laughs> right? Like the, it's like we're testing everything you said in your book. Um, and I think the kind of outcome is, is like, like we were talking about earlier, uh, very clear. There's one aspect of it I think is really, one concept that I learned about just before uh, COVID that really helped me to think about it as well. I learned about it from an amazing woman called Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who's the Surgeon General of California. And it really helped me. It might sound a bit weird for a minute, just bear with me. So she said, imagine one day you're walking down the street and out of the blue you were attacked by a bear and you survive. In the weeks and months that follow, something totally involuntary would happen to your attention. You would find it harder to like read a book or do your work because a big part of your brain would just be scanning for risk and danger, right? Something came out of the blue and attacked you, so your brain is going to be like, well, what the hell else is going to come out of the blue and attack me? Okay, now imagine that you were attacked by a bear again, and you survive again. You've got to be unlucky in this scenario, but it's not possible. Um, maybe the bear's got a grudge against you. Um, if that happened, in the weeks and months that followed, you would likely flip into a state called hypervigilance, right? Um, hypervigilance is where you can't focus on the things that are right in front of you, um, because your mind is just scanning for well, what, what's the danger around me, right? And um, so soldiers who return from wars are often in a state of hypervigilance. Abused children are often in a state of hypervigilance. And I think one of the things that's happened to us in COVID is a lot of us have been in a state of really heightened vigilance, right? And we've really found it hard to focus. I remember at the start of COVID, lots of people going like, oh, we're going to be shut inside. I'm going to learn French on Duolingo. I'm going to read War and Peace. And you want to notice no one read War and Peace and no one learned French, right? In fact, people Googling how do I get my brain to work increased by, by more than 300%. And, and I think it was because we were flipped into this state of hypervigilance. And I remember this child psychologist called John Giardini, an amazing guy who I interviewed in Adelaide in Australia, said a really interesting thing to me. He said, you know, um, uh, deep focus is a really great strategy when you're safe. Sit and read a book, you'll grow, you'll learn. Deep focus is a really dumb strategy when you're in danger, right? You'd be a fool to sit at a battlefield in a war reading a novel. You're going to get shot in the head, right? We evolved <clears throat> to be able to pay attention and think deeply when we feel safe. And we literally haven't been safe the last two years, partly because of the virus, partly because of the way it's upended all our lives. So I think a lot of people, it, it's partly that we've been, our needs have been met less, so we're more depressed, we're more anxious. Um, but also, I just think, also it's just been, a, for a lot of people, it's been this process of, of feeling really unsettled and vigilant the whole time. Does that ring true to you all? Does that, does that, I mean, that's how I know a lot of people I know have felt. Um, so it's this weird thing where we've been in this weird situation, but we haven't been able to think very clearly about this weird situation we're in, which is a, kind of like a double whammy. It's like you're knocked off balance, but you don't really have the energy or attention to think it through properly. You know, and it's on top... We've been so unbalanced for so long. You know, we sure. had the... If you think about Trump and all the anxiety that comes with that, and then we have COVID and, you know... It, so, yeah, there's been... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're talking to a group of people who have been trying to learn through this experience. You poor and, teach. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I just as an educator, I've seen that firsthand, just the shift and change. And, and I've never even heard it phrased that way. So I appreciate that idea of like when you're in that state of hypervigilance or fear, uh, how are you going to learn? You're definitely not in that optimal space to embrace new ideas and take on new things. And that's what we're asking these students to do. So Well, and also if you think about screens, right, and interacting through screens, obviously there's lots of good things about screens we can all imagine how much worse the pandemic would have been if we hadn't had them. But, you know, there's a moment that really clarified my thinking about this. Because for Lost Connections, in fact, I went to, this is before COVID, obviously, I went to interview, uh, I went to the first ever internet rehab center in, in the world. It's in Washington State. It's just outside Spokane. 
I remember when I arrived, it's like a place in the woods. And I remember when I arrived, the first thing I did totally instinctively, I got out of the car and I looked at my phone uh, and was really pissed off I didn't have signals. Oh, shit, I need to get online. And I was like, oh, wait, you came to the Internet Rehab Centre. You're in the right place. Um, and it was totally fascinating to, to talk to the, the, the people there. So they get all kinds of people there, but they disproportionately get young men who've become obsessed with online multiplayer role-player games. Like, World of, at the time, it was World of Warcraft. It would be Fortnite now. Um, or young men who... Uh, there's an overlap, obviously, but also young men who became obsessed with pornography. Are like unhealthily obsessed with it. Um, and it was super interesting talking to these young guys because I spent quite a lot of time with them. And afterwards, I, I went out with Dr. Hilary Cash, who's the woman who set up this clinic. And she said to me, you know, she said, why, why do we, we feel so dissatisfied when we're interacting through screens? And she was saying it, I was thinking a lot about these, these guys who become obsessed with porn. And I thought, in a way, I think the relationship between social media and social life is a bit like the relationship between porn and sex, right? I'm not anti-porn, but if your whole sex life consisted of looking at porn, you'd be kind of pissed off the whole time because that's not what we evolved for. We evolved to actually have sex, and no one spends like an hour looking at porn and feels like valued and sated the way you do after sex, at least if it goes well. Um, the, the, and in a way, I feel like what we've been trapped in in the last two years with this screen-based interaction is a bit like, you know, if all of us have to stop having sex and only look at pornography, it's this kind of... It's close enough to the thing that you're craving that it'll meet a certain basic itch, but it's not the thing you need, right? And actually, in a way, the fact that it's so close makes it even more frustrating, in a way. Um, it's like you're talking to each other on Zoom, right? It's sort of like it, but I can't really see your eyes. Uh, we all know that the people who are watching this online are going to get less of a sense. I don't feel they're hearing me. I know they're there. I believe it. But I don't feel they're hearing me, and, I, and they don't feel I'm talking to them, even though now I'm literally looking at the camera. They still don't feel I'm talking to them, and they're right. I'm not. Not in the way I'm talking to you, right? Because I can see you. Um, and I think one of the... If we think about... Or remind me to say another thing about Hillary Cash in a minute, the doctor there, who said a really interesting thing about this as well, but... In a way, what, if we think about the blessings of COVID, I don't want to be glib about this, a million Americans have died. This, this has been a terrible thing. Uh, and vastly more people all over the world. But if we think about the blessings, one of the blessings, I think, is that you know, my friend Naomi Klein, who's a great writer, uh, has, has talked about this. What, what's happened is the last 10 years now, we've been on a trajectory where we're spending more and more of our time on screens, Right? And, and the plan was for that to just continue and get more and more intense. So 10 years, 15 years from now, all our kids would be at school on Zoom, all of that kind of thing. And what happened is COVID slammed us to where we, we were headed to be in 15 years' time, right? And what it's done is given us a vision of a future. And we can ask ourselves, do we like that future? Is that what we want? I have not heard one person in the last two years say the sentence... Hooray, another Zoom call, right? Not once. Uh, this is not how we want to live, right? This is, it's not that I'm not saying we should all join the Amish. There's loads of great things about technology. But we need a balance, and this is no way to live, right? And so we need to take that lesson of COVID. We, ha we, we, we had that experience of what an all-screen life is like for, for necessary reasons, right? We had to stop the virus from spreading. I, I get it. I'm in favor of it. And most of the restrictions I'm in favour of, but we can. Although I think the balance was, I spent a lot of the pandemic in Las Vegas because of writing a book about Vegas. It is an insane set of priorities that the casinos have been open for two years and the schools have been closed. No sane society would make those priorities, right? That's madness. Um, but within that, you know, so if you're going to tolerate a little bit of risk, I would have said, well, let's have the risk be our kids need to go to school. Call me crazy, um, but but. Um, but yeah, I also think, just, just to say one thing about this, Hilary Cash, the doctor who set up that internet rehab centre, said such an interesting thing to, thing to me as well about these young men who are obsessed with the games. Um, she said to me, you've got to ask yourself, what are these young men getting out of these games? Because they're doing it because they're getting something out of it, right? And she said to me, and bear in mind this is even before COVID, she said they're getting the things they used to get out of the culture but that they no longer get. They're getting a sense from the games that they're physically roaming around, 
right? The average American child basically never left their house before COVID, except with adult supervision. They're getting a sense they're exploring. We don't let our kids ever do that anymore. Um, they're getting a sense that other people see them. Again, a very lonely society. They don't get that. Um, they're getting a sense they're good at something. We have a school system that in particular makes boys feel completely incompetent, is constantly telling them they're not good enough, is making them do unbelievably stupid tests that prove nothing. It's built a whole education system around this idiocy of testing all the time, memorizing meaningless shit for tests that don't measure anything. Um, but they're getting, but they're getting like a kind of parody of those things, right? That it feels like they're getting them. They're getting it to some degree, but they're not getting that in a kind of healthy way. Uh, we should not say video. Ga- I'm not against video games, obviously, but you know, why why are so many people obsessed with it? Because it's again, it's like the thing they've lost, but it's not quite the thing that they need. It's in that difficult and uncomfortable midpoint between the two. Um, and I think COVID has really given us a. a, a, a a very extreme dose of these things that can help to teach us, okay, how does this really make us feel? Excellent. Thank you. So you can go. Why don't you introduce yourself to Johan hey. and uh, ask your question. It should be on. Just flip it up. I couldn't make that work either, so don't worry. There's no judgment. Is it not working? It's this, it's this button here. You have to really push it. Ra- it's dead. Okay, well, here, come on up. You can grab it. We'll just do it this way. I'm oh, a prop is gone for if you like. Great. Hi, my name is Ashlyn. Um, I have a second year here, double majoring in communication sciences and in, sciences and disorders in Spanish. Uh, and I just wanted to start out by saying I really enjoyed reading your book. Um, you know, growing up, like up until high school, I feel like I never really got to learn much about mental health. And so coming into college, um, we were encouraged to read your book for a class. And so I'm really glad um, that we were encouraged to do that. Um, and I guess one question I had, or rather a concern when talking about mental health, is I really want to show support and like be there for friends or family members who maybe have addressed that they have um, you know, some kind of mental health issue. Uh, I guess one thing that holds me back is fear of saying something wrong, coming off as insensitive, or saying something that would upset them more. And so I guess what are some practical ways that we can care for them or um, just show our support for um, people in our lives who are struggling with mental health? Yeah, that's such a good question. And, and, and the you know, it's a question that comes from such a place of love that you want to help the, the people. So you should be really proud of yourself for that. And I guess I would say is, if you don't say anything and you don't help, for the perfectly understandable reason that you're giving, you're kind of guaranteeing you won't help. So at least there's a risk. There's definitely always a risk in acting, but I would say the risk in acting is always better than the risk of just doing nothing, right? Um, in terms of what, what you can do, it's really interesting. It comes to the, there's a... And I should say, I actually disagree with a lot of the mainstream um, discourse about this. So if we think about stigma, right, and we want to reduce stigma, so one of the ways things you want to say to people is, you know, you shouldn't feel ashamed for feeling this way. Um, So everyone agrees we need to reduce stigma. But it's really interesting. Generally, the way we have tried to reduce stigma in our culture in the US um, is we've said to people, well you've got a disease, like a biological disease, right? And so you wouldn't feel bad about having cancer, so you shouldn't feel bad about, about, it, feel it, about being depressed or anxious or whatever. And that is a, everyone who says that is 100% well-intentioned and they're doing it out of love. But actually, there was a really interesting set of experiments suggested that's, that's actually a, quite a bad way of trying to reduce stigma. Um, so there's a woman, um, uh, Professor Meta, I'm blanking on her first name, at the University of Alabama, who did this really interesting research on this. There's, there's other research on this, but she did a really good set of research. What they did is, so let's say that, Ashley, you were the person taking part in the experiment, right? You come in, and you're paired with another person, and you think that person is also a student like you. You don't know they're an actor, right? And they basically say, um, we need you to fill in a questionnaire about your life before you start the experiment. If you're ever in an experiment, and they say that, by the way, that's always the experiment has actually begun. Um, And you, you, you chat with the person next to you. And sometimes the person next to you will say, uh, I'm depressed because I have a biological disease. And sometimes they'll say, I'm depressed because of really bad things that have happened to me. So they might give an example about being abused as a child or something, right? 
And then you go and you think this is the experiment beginning, and you're paired up, and um, you are told that the other person, the, the actor, but you don't know it's an actor, has to learn something on a computer. And they say every time they get, get it wrong, push this button and they'll get an electric shock, right? It won't kill them or anything, but it'll be a painful electric shock. And they wanted to find out, would there be a difference on how often and how hard you would electrocute the person based on the story you were told about them? And it turned out, if you were told they had a biological disease, you would electrocute them much more and much harder than if they, they were told, actually, I'm, I, I'm depressed because of bad things that have happened to me. And I think what this tells us, and it's relevant to your question, which is actually, and there's lots of wider evidence for this, the way to reduce stigma is essentially to say, well, God, if I was in your position, I'd feel exactly the same. Right? To say to people, your pain makes sense. What, what saying to people that it's just a biological disease says is it sort of separates them out. They're a kind of subspecies, right? And bio- re- telling people things with biological diseases never reduce stigma. No one ever doubted that AIDS was a biological disease. There was a shit ton of stigma towards AIDS patients, right? Um, no one really doubted, apart from very early on, that leprosy was a disease. Lepers were the most stigmatized people. Um, so actually, f- for me, when I try and approach people uh, who, who are in this position... I think the, 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 the best thing to do is to approach in a position of humility and just be like, I just want to sit with you. Just being physically present with someone who's distressed. It's one of the reasons why the last two years have been so hard as well. We couldn't do it. Just being physically present and just listening and just saying, God, if I was in your position, I'd feel the same. Your pain makes sense. It, just telling people their pain makes sense is incredibly powerful. We live in a culture that completely delegitimizes people's pain. Either you, you, your pain is delegitimized at work so you can get back to work, right? Think about something as basic as grief. Everyone here would agree uh, if your child dies, you're going to feel absolutely terrible for a long time, and you should. That's a necessary part of being human. But the DSM, the new DSM, the new guidelines in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is what was used to diagnose mental health problems, has just d- said that if you, if you are grieving for more than two months, you're suffering from gr- extreme grief disorder, right? What, a, what an insane and disgusting thing, right? Imagine saying to someone whose child has died, oh, two months have passed, come on now, no more crying. You know, it, it's despicable, right? So we live in a culture that sort of officially delegitimizes people's pain, even stuff where everyone agrees it's legitimate pain, like grief, right? So I would just say listening, being present, being consistent and showing up. There's definitely a risk in that. Um, but the risk of not doing it, I would say, is greater. And I think kind of to confront that fear in yourself, knowing that you'll never know if you're doing the right thing, right, at some level, because you, you never know what would have happened if you hadn't acted. But I think um, approaching them in that spirit of what's the story here how you know, and, and often just asking people what help they need. You know, I think going in with a kind of right, I'm here to rescue you is not is generally not a good plan. But just going in and listening, letting them tell their story, being humble, and, and just listening to what they're saying they need can really can really help. Oh, okay. Kylie, hello. Hey, Kylie. Hi, my name is Kylie. I am uh, alcohol and drug studies major, I guess. I don't know. I've been going to school on and off since the 80s, so I've got like a year left, I think. I'm not like getting my PhD. I've been in my like just four years. So anyway, um, so I apologize if this is a long question, but um, I had to write it out because I was going to be all over the place. But okay, so here's my thinking. First of all, I could be a poster child for lost connections. Like I cannot even, I really could. And I'm just telling you. So it was really cool that I um, had to read the book for class, because I don't know that I would have. I don't do a whole lot of reading anymore just for enjoyment, just because I don't. Um, but I'm really happy that I did. And so one of my questions is, I'm, I'm in my mid-50s, so, and my father and my mother are both psychologists. So Viktor Frankl, you're familiar with Viktor Frankl? Okay, so my son was 18. He is completely obsessed with Viktor Frankl and man's search for meaning and all that. And we've had a lot of conversations recently, me about your book and him about Viktor Frankl, and just some different kind of connections. And when you look at some things, it's kind of like purposeful work, purposeful love, courage, um, 
in the face of difficulty, things like that in Viktor Frankl's book. And then these are things I'm familiar with. Then you move ahead decades and you go to like um, Rat Park, which I remember my father telling me about back in the 80s. And you go, okay, wow, look at that. There's this thing about connections. And these rats would rather connect with one another than necessarily take this morphine or or, um, whatever opioids it was you were giving them. So you look at that. So that's, you know, a few decades later. Now we're here today, and your book, which is phenomenal, like I said, it's absolutely wonderful, and it's been, I'm very thankful I was able to read it and to be able to meet you, but, and I I hate to say this, because I am not a negative person, I'm 55 years old going to school because I think I can make change, so I'm very, very positive, but the reality is, is we can sit and talk about these things and we can we can bring them up and we can you know say how they all work we can do self help help books we can do all this kind of stuff but with medications and pharmaceutical companies there's never going to be the kind of money or funding needed for people to start focusing on programs outside of the medication like connections and things like that and i hate to be again i'm not trying to be negative um, as a matter of fact, I'm sure you're familiar with the D.A.R.E. program. I was a product of that. In 1994, there was a study through the government that said, the government says, this is not effective. Yet through 2012, we were still spending almost $10 million a year on it. And right now it's down about $3 million. And like, I get like emotional about that because the amount of things that could actually be done to make an impact in our country on drug abuse, on loneliness, on connections is insane. But nobody out there, our our decision makers right now, are the people who are thinking about money. So it's like, okay, do I sit and I go, you know what, here's where I'm at. I'd love to make change. I could make change. But the reality is I have to kind of be looking at my kids who are 18 and 21. Would it be better for me to step back and say, I need to come up with a program that's going to intervene with third graders or before third grade when there's really the opportunity to make those interventions and help kids learn life skills so they can feel confident, so they understand the importance of connections, so they understand and then kind of just go from there but have like a consistency. It's just nobody's like making that move. And it just it frustrates me because it just feels like in another 20 years, Someone else will write a book. And I, and I hate to say that, but it's such, it, I, like I literally, I could write a book about how your book is, is me. And it, it, that's awesome. But that's not the point. I don't want other people to have to do that. I want other people to have the opportunity to not have to live that way. Totally. I think it's such an important point, Kylie. And so I definitely have days where I feel like you're feeling right now, where you just think how, you know, we're te- I'm talking about taking on such big and powerful forces And when I feel like that, there's two things I think about a lot. Um, One is my grandmothers. So I'm I'm 43. My grandmothers were the age I am now in 1962. One of them was a working-class Scottish woman living in a uh, housing project. And the other was a Swiss peasant woman living in a wooden hut on the side of a mountain. And in 1963, my grandmother's lives were horrific. Um, neither of them were allowed to have bank accounts in their own names because they were married women. This was true everywhere in the world. Married women didn't, weren't allowed to have bank accounts in their own name. It was legal for their husbands to rape them, as it was legal in every country in the world for a woman to be raped by her husband. My Swiss grandmother wasn't even allowed to vote, right? She wasn't allowed to work outside the home without the written permission of her husband. Um, and that was what life was like for pretty much all women in the world everywhere. And that was the way it had been for women forever, right? And I think about how, you know, my grandmothers were amazing women. I loved them. And they never got to have the lives they should have had, right? Like my Swiss grandmother loved to paint and draw. When she started painting and drawing, they told her to shut the fuck up and get into the kitchen, right? And then I think, so I think about their lives as they were then. And then I think about my niece's life. I don't want to for a second underestimate how much further we've got to go to achieve liberation for women. And I'm very conscious of how annoying it is to have a man mansplain this to a room full of women. But I think about my niece's life, right? Even the most crazy far-right politician would not say my niece shouldn't be allowed to have a bank account or it should be legal for a man to rape her or she shouldn't be allowed to vote. If anyone suggested that, they would be, you know, like, the craziest wingnut doesn't say that, right? My niece loves to paint and draw. 
She never knew my grandmother, sadly. But when my niece loved to paint and draw, we didn't tell her to shut the fuck up and get into the kitchen. We told her we, told her we should start Googling art schools. And at any given moment, it seems like the obstacles are impossible. But when people say to me, the forces that we have to take on are... And you're totally right, Kylie, they're really powerful. I, I always think it's true... They're literally not a hundredth as powerful as men were in 1963. Men controlled every single institution of power in the whole world, every company, every country, every police force, and they had, ever since those things were introduced, apart from a few queens, hereditary queens along the way, right? And the women of my grandmother's generation, they didn't go, we're never going to win this one. You know, I mean, they would have been totally entitled to think that. The odds were, like, almost impossible against them. They started where they stood and they fought where they could. And they fought at every place in the society, every household, every workforce, and at a national level. And we've come a long way. And there's dangers that we'll, have to, we'll go backwards. We all know what might is probably going to happen to Roe versus Wade very soon. Um, it's not a kind of bankable victory. There's, there's all, or I'll give you another example, right? I'm gay. And when I get depressed about the possibility of progress. I think a lot about a friend of mine called Andrew Sullivan, who's a British-American writer. So in 1994, Andrew was diagnosed as HIV positive at the height of the AIDS crisis, when there was no hope in sight, as far as anyone knew. His best friend, Patrick, had just died of AIDS. And Andrew, who was in his um, early 30s, was like, well, okay, I'm going to die really soon. So I'm going to do one last thing before I die. So he quit his job and he went to a place called Provincetown in Cape Cod to write a book about a crazy utopian idea that no one had ever written a book about before. And he was like, okay, I'm never going to live to see this idea put into practice. No one alive today will ever live to see it put into practice. But maybe someone somewhere down the line will find this book and find this idea and fight for it. The idea that Andrew wrote the first ever book for, book about, was gay marriage. And when I get depressed, I try to imagine going back in time to Provincetown in 1994 and saying to Andrew, OK, Andrew, you're not going to believe me, but 26 years from now, A, you'll be alive. That would have blown his mind. B, you'll be married to a man, because that's going to be legal. Also, he's going to be really hot. Uh, C, <laughs> C, I will be with you when the Supreme Court of the United States makes it mandatory for every state in the union to introduce gay marriage rights. And the next day, you're going to be invited to a White House lit up in the colours of the rainbow flag to have dinner with the president to celebrate what you and millions of other people have achieved. Oh, and by the way, that president, he's going to be black, right? That would have sounded like the most crazy science fiction. We only saying to you, so Kylie, 26 years from now, a trans president is going to invite us to smoke crack with her in the Oval Office, right? It would have... I mean, not that we want that. The trans president, yes, not the crack. But... It would have sounded ludicrous, right? But it happened. It happened because enough people saw that there was something better that could happen and banded together and appealed to other people in the spirit of love. And it's not like this was a small thing. 2,000 years of gay people being imprisoned, burned, you know, destroyed. And in the space of basically 60 years, the whole edifice comes down of homophobia. I'm not saying there aren't still problems. Of course there are. But the whole legal edifice comes crashing down, right? So these forces that are so powerful, they want us to think that they are eternal and impregnable and there's nothing we can do to take them on. And they are as fallible as every other institution of power has ever been. So we, we can be able... Despair is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If we, if we despair, then it won't change, right? Yes. So just the end of that real quickly is, like, you've got Elton John giving you two comments. I don't know if you know Elton, but that's cool of you. <laughs> um, but so name dropping is really cool. So when I do come up with a solution, can I drop your name? Of course, yes, okay. definitely. Okay. Thank you. Exactly. He's so nice, Elton John, by the way. <laughs> I tried to persuade him to sing it. I once said to him, because you know he sang at Princess Diana's funeral? Um, I said to him, if I die in an accident, I don't know him that well. I said, if I die in an accident, will you come and sing at my funeral? And he, and he looked, just, he paused and said, if it's a really slow week and I've got nothing else to do, maybe. Hi, my name is Haley. Hi, Haley. Um, I'm a third year recreation parks and leisure service major. And the one question I have from writer to writer is, is that after writing all your books, 
Is there anything that you would have liked to go back and change about your book, Lost Connections? Or my second kind of part is, is there anything you really wish you could go back and add? Oh, God, that's such a good question. So whenever anyone says, loads of people today have said they work at Parks and Rec, so I'm literally picturing you as in that sitcom, and it's really <laughs> pleasing to me. Um, the, uh, it would make me so happy to live in the world of Parks and Rec, if it is actually like that, <laughs> and not just because of Chris Pratt. Um, the, um, it's a really good question, and the truth is I never think about it, because I, I've never reread any of my books after they come out. Every now and then... To remind myself of a fact, I have to look at it. And I always go, oh my God, this is so shit. This is terrible. <laughs> Te- we should just burn all the copies. I've, um, I've only ever twice interacted with anyone in public who I didn't expect to be with my book. One was, I was on a plane in Colombia and someone was reading the Spanish edition of, um, of Chasing the Scream. And I don't speak Spanish at all, right? I was so excited. I kind of go up to this room and I go, me esculpa, me esculpa. Me libro, me, me libro. And she looked at me and said, went, no, me libro. <laughs> and I suddenly realised she thought I was saying she'd taken my book. And I'm like, no, 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 um, escribo, escribo, me, me libro. And she goes, no. And looked absolutely <laughs> like horrified and I had to just sort of walk away. So she just thought there was this some random mad person trying to steal her book. So it was a really sad experience. Uh, the other time was I, I once I flew from London to Melbourne in Australia. And um, I couldn't sleep at all the night before or on the layover or on the flight or anything. So when I landed, I was like, you know when you're like so tired that you're like delirious, right? And I was in the airport at the bus stop waiting for the bus into the city. And suddenly I, I could hear my own voice talking about depression, but my lips weren't moving. And I honestly thought, Am I, have I gone mad? Like... Am I having, like, a psychotic breath? Is this what it feels like? It's like, should I call an ambulance? What should I do? And then suddenly I realised that someone was listening to the audiobook of my book in their car. And if I had been more, like, on the ball, I would have, like, leaned forward and been like, hello. Because can you imagine how weird that would be? If, like, you're in Australia and you're reading a British person's... Or read the signature British person's audiobook, and suddenly they, like, appear in front of you. Like, it was such a, But I was so out of it. I just... They just drove off, and I was like, oh, OK. But, yeah. So um, I'm sure if I went back and read it, I would want to change everything, and I would hate it and want to burn it. Um, it but and I think that's true. You know, the, uh, the British writer Will Self said once, ninety percent of writing is about managing your nausea at what you've produced, and it's it's so true. Only bad writers love rereading their work, in my experience. And it's true that there are also bad writers who don't like reading it. So it's not a guarantee that you're a good writer just because you don't like it. But the yeah, I just think you. you is, and you guys will all feel this with your essays and things. There's this real balance when, how do you know when it's good enough? Because the enemy of producing anything is perfectionism, right? If you're if you're a perfectionist, you just never write a book, right? Because it's such a messy lot. You wouldn't write an essay. You wouldn't do anything if you're a perfectionist. Um, so it's how do you know you've made it as good as you can in that moment? Is a really difficult dilemma, and I never really know the answer. And sometimes. Sometimes I feel... So I do certain things that I think try to reduce my nausea. I, like, after I've written it, I read the whole thing out loud to myself, and then you start to hear some bits that are wrong. I try to give myself headspace to sort sort of think about... pull back. I'm always trying to think about this thing Stephen Pinker, the writer, calls the curse of knowledge, which is once you know something you sort of instinctively forget that other people don't know it. So when you're explaining it, you start using shortcuts. So you always want to, whenever you're writing anything, you always want to write with, okay, imagine I didn't know this. Would this still make sense? And it's very hard to do. It's a really difficult discipline. Um, but yeah, the answer is I, I, would, I would never reread them for that reason, <laughs> ever. Well, when I'm old and I've got dementia, maybe I'll reread them. <laughs> Um, I do have a second little oh, sure. half, too. Um, do you plan on wanting to write more, keep writing more books, or do you think you've kind of, you feel comfortable where you're at? Oh, no, it's my job. <laughs> I can't carry on. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, figured, I figured, obviously, there'd be more, and I'm thrilled if there is oh. going to be more, because I've read all three so far, oh. and I, I love them. Oh, thank you so much. Of it's course. So I actually brought my book for you to autograph today, so. Oh, hooray. Amazing. I will sign anything you want. Hooray. <laughs> thank it reminds you. Me of the, worst, I, what's that, uh, the first time I ever did a book signing, 
Uh, this is the weirdest experience that ever happened. It was the very first one, which made me gave me unrealistic <laughs> expectations. A woman came up to me. It was in Baltimore in a place called Red Emmers. And she said, will you write a message for someone? And I said, sure. What do you want me to write? She said, will you write, dear Patrick, it's over. I never loved you anyway. <laughs> And I was like, no, you tell Patrick you don't love what? No. And she got really pissed. She's like, well, I bought the book. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not... That's a guarantee that I'll write anything you want, right? It was really horrible. She got really pissed off and, like, stormed out. Um, but anyway, I won't dump your boyfriend for you, but I will do anything, write anything else you want. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name's Jessica Pace. Um, I am a senior, and I'm double majoring in psychology and ADS. Uh, my question What's ADS? Is, alcohol and drug, alcohol, drug oh, studies. Um, my question is, if you have, like, kind of asked you this earlier. So if you have someone, uh, a loved one, who is struggling with depression but is super close-minded and, like, you can see them, I don't know, having problems with, like, their antidepressants and everything, is there, like, any way to kind of try to get their minds open into... Like, I don't know, reading your book or finding other resources rather than just deteriorating in, like, the depression and anti antidepressants. It is such an important and such a difficult question. Um, I can't remember who said this, but someone said, one of the most powerful things you can ever do is give someone a story for their distress. And one of the most destabilizing things you can ever do is try to change their story about their distress. Um, so it's... Ex if you have a story about your pain, even if it's not a very good story and it's not working for you very well, it sounds like the people you're describing, their story isn't working very well, at least you feel like you know where you are, right? And there's a moment when people let go of the old story they have. It's almost like letting a dog off a leash, right? It's like, like a rabid dog. At least, at least you had it chained up when you had a story. And when it's gone, it's like your pain could just attack you at any, any level. Um... So I guess what I would try to do in that situation is, is the candid answer is it's really difficult, right? I would try to... In so arguing with them won't work, right? It just doesn't... It, in fact, it will be counterproductive. It produces a backfire effect where they will, de they will entrench in their own view. So you won't get there through rational argument. I guess what I would recommend as a first step is trying to identify if the individual has any doubts of any kind at all. And if just get uh, the more they can sense that you could tell they can tell you that doubt non judgmentally, the more likely they are to articulate it. And if they have any doubts, getting them to articulate their doubts and then trying over time to sort of tease out their doubts more and more and doing it very slowly and gently. Let them articulate their doubt, then don't bring it up again for three weeks. And then get them to articulate their doubt again, then don't bring it up for three weeks. And then go, you know, I was thinking about that thing you said. You know, and trying to just expand the space for doubt in their mind a little bit more every time, but doing it really slowly and, and, and giving them as much of a sense of security as possible that you're someone they can lean on to just have that non-judgmental conversation. I think what won't, doesn't work is for you to try to inject your doubt into their head, right? Even if you're right, and <laughs> I suspect you're right, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. You've got, they've got, if it doesn't articulate in their own mind, um, it, it won't work. So, um, and also it's about saying to people, I always try to put it, for example, when I talk about antidepressants, chemical antidepressants, my position is we need to expand the menu of options. I don't want to take anything off the menu. Anything that helps people is good by me, right? Um, so I think if you go into it in a sort of, you wouldn't do this, but if you go into it in a kind of deprivation based, I'm going to take this away from you. Uh, this is bad and it should be taken away from you. That's not going to work. It's about expanding the, the menu of options and find, you know, finding alternative things that can help that may over time mean they don't feel they need that, the, the, the drug. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I know it's not a great answer, but the truth is there isn't a great answer to the question you're asking. I think it's the only one that kind of um, uh, has any chance of succeeding. And, and the ch you want to be candid, the chance is not great, but it, it, that increases your chances. Thank you. Also, it, also it's difficult because the whole culture is reinforcing the message that you're trying to challenge, right? The whole culture is saying to people, 
oh, it's just a brain disease, but my doctor told me I'm just lacking serotonin in my brain. And at some level, we all know that's not the only explanation. <laughs> of course. No one, when you say to them, lonely, the science shows loneliness increases depression. No one's like, no way. What? Right? You say, financial insecurity increases depression. No one's going to go, well, I don't believe that one. <laughs> right? The, but I remember, it's really weird, I remember doing an interview for NPR about Lost Connections when it came out. And the interviewer said to me, I didn't handle it well. I was talking about how loneliness causes depression. And she said to me, well, this is a very controversial argument. And I said, it's a sign that this culture has gone mad that you can say that to me, right? Your grandmother would have thought that was the most banal and obvious thing anyone has ever said, right? Can you imagine going back in time and saying to your grandmother, gee, grandma, do you think being lonely makes you more likely to feel like shit, right? Right? My grandmother would have like said, why are you wasting my time? Get out of, get out of the room, right? Uh, anyway, yeah, sorry. A slightly ranty last point. <laughs> Hello. Hi, my name is Andrea. I Hi, Andrea. am a third-year student, um, social work major with a psychology minor. Um, so my question is, you spoke about in the book, um, specifically cyclobin, and kind of talked about um, that type of medication. Um, for treatment of depression, and I was just wondering what your thoughts were on using like other non-conventional treatments, like um, ketamine therapies, things like that, or um, transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation. Like, what your thoughts were on that? If you've done any further research into those. Um, you said transcranial. What was the one before that? Ketamine. Ketamine. Ketamine, ketamine so, therapies. Yeah. yeah. So there's much better evidence for ketamine than for transcranial stimulation. There just hasn't been that much research on transcranial. St- trans. trans- oh. I'll say it. Transcranial stimulation. There you go. Um, so for people who don't know, the, the, um, there's pretty good research now. So I want to be careful about the psychedelic stuff because I think it's being explained to people in a way that's a bit too simplistic. So um, I'll give you an example of an actual study. It was done by a guy called Dr. Robin Carhart-Harris, a friend of mine in London. Um, so what they do is they get people who've been really depressed for a really long time and nothing has helped them. They've tried loads of things and nothing's helped. And they give them really high doses of psilocybin, which is the active component in magic mushrooms. And the result is it is complex. So the first bit is what people mostly get told about, which is it massively reduces their depression. And and it was staggering, right? They were much less depressed afterwards. It was extremely effective. But there's a kind of sting in the tail, which I think is important, which doesn't undermine at all the case for psychedelics, but I think needs, means we need to think about it in a more complicated way. So as an example, there was a woman who uh, was in this study who um, worked in, a, in an office. She was a receptionist in an office uh, in, a, the, uh, in a town that's sort of like the equivalent of Atlantic City in Britain. It's a kind of quite depressing seaside town, right? So she was really depressed. She gets this side of the side, but she's like, oh my God, I'm connected to the whole universe. I'm connected to nature. I'm connected to all other living beings, right? And she feels much better. She gets this like super dose of connection. And then she goes back to work in her office. And she said, I can't walk around my office feeling that I'm connected to all of humanity because if I did, I'll get fired. <laughs> I can't go up to my boss and go, you look so sad, right? That's what we're trying to do. Why don't we just hug and go and sit under a tree? You can't do that, right? So she got a taste of connection, but then she went back to an environment that undermines connection. And so the complexity is what I, what I think psychedelics can do in the right context, and you don't just want to randomly take them on your own and things, important caveat, um, what they do, I think, is they sort of show us a direction in which we might want to travel. But then most people are going to, not going to want to take psychedelics like every week, right? But, or, and most people can't, and nor, nor I think should they really. Um, so what it does is it shows you, okay, if you get a taste of a lot of connection, you feel much better. Okay, how can we now change our lives together so more and more of us have more and more connection? So it's almost like a taster. I think sometimes psychedelics are being a bit oversold at the moment, where it's being presented as if the psychedelics will solve the problem for you. And I don't think that's right. They, are, they can be part of the solution for some people, definitely, because they can show you what it's like to not feel like this. And they also, we know that, they dis, that they're, they're sort of story disruptors, right? A bit like your, your relative, right? If you think about what often happens... 
particularly people who are depressed, is you get trapped in a story about who you are and what has happened to you. And what psychedelics do is they just blast your story open, right? They just completely challenge the story that you've got about yourself. Um, and that gives you an opportunity to then recast your, your story. Um, so in that sense, they can really help. But it doesn't do the job for you. It just, it's just a moment, of like a break in the, the chain for a minute. Or you think about even like one of the things depression is, is getting trapped in your own ego and feeling you're just rattling around in your own ego. And what psychedelics do is they just switch off the part of your brain that thinks about ego, right? That you, you can't think egotistically when you're under the influence of psilocybin. It's why people will often kind of, I'm sure none of you have ever used psychedelics, but if you have, uh, you, you know, um, you sort of hit yourself in the face or, or you, know, you, you actually forget the boundaries of your own body a lot when you're on psychedelics. Um, so it's, not, it's why you wouldn't just leave someone on psychedelics to walk down the street. It wouldn't work out very well for them. Um, the, yeah, so, so I think they can be a really important part of it. And there's a growing and important body of evidence about this, but the evidence is a little bit more complicated than some of the cheerleaders are, are suggesting, which is not to say I don't agree with them. All the practical things they recommend about providing legal routes for people to access in a medical context psychedelics, I'm just passionately in favour of that. But I also worried we're going to have a bit of a backlash if we over, oversell it. Um, and also a backlash if, if we're not honest that there are risks as well. They're not enormous risks, but there are risks. And especially if people are doing it in contexts that are not sort of regulated and safe, then there are risks. So we want to be a bit careful about that as well. Yeah, time just a couple more. Hello, sure, of course. Yeah. Hurry. I like your jacket. It's very nice. Thank you so much. Okay, so my name is Wendy. Um, I'm getting my master's in social work here. I'm very grateful that you're here. So I'm just soaking this in for a second. <laughs> so, and you, if I start crying, you've got to be used to that by now, right? No, like, in a, like you've changed my life. So if I can get through this question without crying, great. But if I do start crying, like you're, you can, you're, got to be used to that right now. Well, I had a, I once had an experience where I was in a, I was in a taxi in London, and the driver said to me, "Oh, I recognise you," and I was like, um, "No, I don't, I don't think so." And he said, "Are you an actor?" I was like, "I'm not an actor." He's like, oh, "Sure, I recognise you," and he kept like guessing things that I was, and then anyway, I paid him and he drove off, and like. Three minutes later, he drove back and said, Oi! And I said, yeah. And he said, you're the addicted rat's TED Talk wanker. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's me. That's why I want on my grave. The addicted talks, the addicted, addicted rat's TED Talk wanker. Yeah. So, so, so my question is, um, are you faced with pushback from whether it's companies or groups of people? And if you are... How do, you com how do you combat that, and how do you manage that? Also, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, you definitely get pushback. You get, um, in a way, I would be more worried if I didn't get pushback, because you think, if, if you say something and absolutely everyone agrees with you immediately, what you're saying did not need to be said, right? Like, if I said to you all, I think puppies are really cute, right? And I wrote a book, you know, Lost Puppies, right? <laughs> there would be no pushback, right? I don't know, maybe Cruella de Vil will write a book arguing against me, but there aren't going to be many, right? Um, so everything that, everything that needs to be said will, will create... Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate that. Everything that needs to be said will create a backlash. Um, and how you handle that backlash is, is, is psychologically challenging, right? So... Um, some of the, back, the backlash I find most annoying is where people just lie about what you say, right? So I had a kind of wave of backlash against the book, against Lost Connection. People said, he's telling everyone to burn their Prozac and that will make people kill themselves, right? And you kind of reply going, hmm, here's the bit of the book where I say, if you are taking chemical antidepressants and they're helping you, as they did for me and as they do for many people, you should continue, Right? Um, so that's annoying when people start arguing about a sort of fictitious version of you. That's a, that's a pain. And that's the only bit that I really don't like. Because what can you do about that? You just have to go, well, you're arguing, what you're arguing against isn't me, right? Um, but I think with a lot of it, it really helps to think about, like, like with your relative, well, where is this coming from? And usually the objection is coming from a completely le legitimate sense of pain, right? Or think about the, the backlash to Chasing the Scream, my book about addiction, right? Was actually very instructive. There were some people, um, how would I put it? 
give you a specific example. I was on a panel in London as well with a woman who ran a drug rehab centre and a really right-wing politician who was really in favour of the war on drugs. And when we started the panel, I didn't know this woman, when I started the panel, I was like, oh, this is going to be a bit unfair on the right-wing politician because it's going to be two on one. Um, and I talked about Rat Park and compassion and she got really angry and she said to me, and she was siding with him on the war on drugs and said, no, you don't understand, when I was a heroin addict, I was evil, she said. And it was really difficult because on the one hand I'm thinking, God, this woman runs a drug rehab centre. Is this what she's communicating to the really vulnerable people who come into her care? And so part of me is quite angry and indignant. And then I'm thinking, well, what, what, what happened to this woman to make her feel that way? And so many people who've been through addiction internalise a lot of stigma, right? Um, and there's, if you think about stigma, there's sort of two ways you can recover from stigma, right? So let's say you've been addicted and you believed that being addicted was terrible. One thing you can do is go, well, that whole stigma was wrong and no one should be treated like that. That's big. That's a big thing to do. It's actually easier to go, well, I used to be evil and disgusting. The, stigma, the structure of the stigma is right. I used to be evil and disgusting, but now I became a better person, Right? And then you can say, actually, all that pain was worth it. Look, I went through these horrible things. And I lost my children. What, whatever had happened to this woman, I don't know the details of what happened to her. Um, but, you know, but look, it was all worth it because I am no longer one of these bad people. It's easier to say that, to go, none of them are bad people. right? None of them, that, that's not what was happening. So I think it's about understanding where the criticism comes from. Some people are protective of their drugs the antidepressants and don't want them taken away and that's a perfectly legitimate feeling. Some people are very married to the story they have a brain disease because that they think that's the way out of stigma and they think if you're saying it's not a brain disease then it's your fault as if those are the only two options and sometimes people have internalised a lot of stigma and anger. So with that woman who I was on that panel with I just said to her I'm really sorry you were made to feel that way but you were never evil, Right? Um, that, that's not what, what happened here, and I'm really sorry. And I got actually quite emotional. And I think that was more effective than saying to her, how dare you say this? What a disgusting thing to say. Right? Then she would have just retreated back into her, her story. But actually, she emailed me a few weeks later. It wasn't, she wouldn't say, oh, I've had a conversion, and you're absolutely right. But she, I could see that it had sort of, something had landed with her, and she was feeling in some way uncomfortable. So usually the, usually the points of pushback are are from legitimate and understandable places. And then sometimes you get to get people who are being dicks, but, you know, uh, or being egotistical. But then you think, okay, well, why are you being egotistical? You must be feeling bad for some other reason, right? I don't want to sound all Gandhian and, like, I'm just like, oh, let's be nice. To, uh, you know, I get really pissed off with a lot of these people. But the, there's also a thing where psychologically the way it really helps me, this will sound weird and a bit, like, grand, like I'm bigging myself up. I'm not comparing myself to this person, but... Um, so, as you all know, in, in Northern Ireland, there was a civil war for a really long time where Protestants and Catholics were killing each other. And then there was a, a peace process. And the peace process was led by a completely amazing woman called Mo Molum, who was a British politician. And she was dying of, um, she was dying of a brain tumour. And she didn't tell anyone for a long time. And she led the peace process, even though she was dying, knowing this would be the last thing she ever did. And there was this moment where she... Um, Basically, to keep the peace process going, they had to release a lot of terrorists who'd murdered people, it, it done really terrible crimes, because it was the only way of getting the terrorist groups to give up their arms and, and have the negotiations so the two sides would make a deal, right? Um, so she had to release a lot of murderers uh, on both sides, the Protestant side and the Catholic side. And she did this interview on the BBC, and the interviewer says to her, well, now everyone hates you. The Protestants hate you and the Catholics hate you. And she said, she was dead within a couple of years after this, she said, if, they, if, if them hating me means they hate each other a little bit less for long enough that we get over the line and we get a peace deal, then I'll carry all their hatred on my back. Hate me, right? If it gets us over the line, hate me. Don't hate each other, right? And I think about that a lot. She was a completely amazing person. And then they got a peace deal and there isn't a war in Northern Ireland anymore. Um, and I can't really do it. 
But what I try to do is go, well, okay, is it productive for this person to hate me? Does it get us to somewhere better? If this person goes, you fucker, you know, you, you, you know, um, if that woman, if it's her path out of the stigma she was in, I don't mean to point to you as if you were the woman, and, uh, if it gets her out of that, if the path to get out of stigma, if being angry with me is a stage that helps her get beyond that, great. Pour the anger on me. I can take it, right? So, uh, not all the time, <laughs> but that's the kind of mindset I try to get into. It's not easy, and I fail at it most of the time, but, yeah. I know we're running out of time. I just have one quick question for you. Um, you oh, I'm sorry. Was there another question? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go for it. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you for answering my question, because I know we're over time. Oh. Um, my name's Chance. I'm a third-year sport management major. Um, I loved your book, first of all. Um, the thing that stood out to me even after reading it is the story about the paint can shaker. And we talked a little bit about change and uh, people you do know. Um, for young leaders going into the workforce, how can we uh, change that? How can we take care of our paint shakers and make connections so they don't feel bad? Yeah, yeah. That's a really great question. Thank you. I think the best way is we need to change the structure of the way we work, right? So at the moment, most people work in corporations, which are structured like an army. You've got the boss at the top, the boss gives orders. Sometimes you've got a nice dictator in the book company, and sometimes they're an asshole, but you really have no say over that, right? We don't have to work like that. You know, we can work in democratic cooperatives. They exist all over the United States. So democratic cooperatives work completely differently. Um, the, everyone takes decisions together if they, if they don't agree. And if you have to have a boss, you elect the boss and you get rid of the boss if he's an asshole, right? So I would say, in a way, the long-term solution, there's lots of advice you could give to individuals who are in this unjust system. But I would say we need to get rid of the unjust system, right? It, it'd be like saying, if, if I was the dictator of North Korea, how would you tell me to govern North Korea better? I'd say, well, resign as dictator and have an election, right? And in the same way, I'd say, like, what would I say to someone who wants to be the dictator of a company? And it's not what you're saying. But someone who wants to be the dictator of a company, how could they be a better benevolent dictator? I'd say, don't be a dictator. Turn it into a democratic cooperative. I mean, democratic cooperatives do better, right? For the same reason that democracies do better than dictatorships. Why is the United States much richer than Russia? Because in a democracy, everyone gets, you get to take on everyone's thoughts, right? So I would say, in a way, there's all sorts of practical leadership advice if you maintain the unjust system. But I would say just get rid of the unjust system. It's not. Why, why allow it? Why tolerate it? It makes everyone feel like shit. You know, it doesn't even make the bosses feel good. They feel like shit as well. Right? The, the, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. My final question, if oh, you're yes. okay with that. So you, you have a lot of new fans, uh, both here in the room and, and out there on YouTube watching this. And oh. so they all read Lost Connections, but you recently released a new book uh, oh, yeah. just this year. And so uh, this is your opportunity to kind of plug what you did there and maybe what, uh, what you look to do in the future. I'm really curious about, because uh, you guys will be at the front line of this, I suspect, um, just because of your age. Um, it's about why we can't focus and pay attention. And the figures on this are kind of amazing. For every one child who was identified with serious attention problems when I was seven years old, there's now 100 kids who've been identified with that problem. The average American office worker now focuses on any one task for only three minutes. It's funny, I said that to someone recently, and they said, how do they get a whole three minutes? And I was like, Jesus, this is not a good sign. Uh, the, um, so I wanted to understand why that's happening to us and what we can do about it. And a, bit like, a lot like the other things we've been talking about, it's because of these big forces. We're, we're so taught in our culture to think of these things as individual flaws located in the individual. You know, we do that with poverty. We do that with depression. We do it with attention problems. If you can't focus, it's your fault, blame yourself. Actually, it's the result of really huge forces that are manipulating you. And the solution is we've got to take on those, those forces together. Um, so, yeah, that's what the, 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 uh, the book is about. Um, yeah, and while I was outside, the, the very Oprah interview that I mentioned has been released today, so you can uh, listen to it. Uh, she, um, yeah, I, I get a little, I'm not very articulate like I normally am because I was just like... It's an opera. But, the, uh, but you can listen to it if you want to. But you've probably heard enough of me by now. But, uh, but you've never heard enough of opera. <laughs> <laughs> well, perfect. Why don't we give Johan another round of applause? Thanks, everyone. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, internet people. Awesome. Well, 
from now, you, there's still more of the summit for you all that are here today. There are breakout sessions that you can go and learn from some other leaders on some really great topics. So if you're wondering where to go, look in the, uh, I was going to call it a bulletin, but the, uh, the, the brochure uh, for today's event, and you can kind of see what's being discussed and in which room. All of them are just down the hall here, so it's not very far uh, for you to go and enjoy the rest of the uh, conference. Terrific. So next door, you can go and see some of your fellow students uh, and the work and the research that they're doing right next door.